Have you seen that equation before? Yeah, me neither. Um, I just made it up. But what we have today is a really cool video. I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe how this equation works. But uh, we're going to be up in Clinton, which is our critical access hospital just north of here. We're going to teach some ICU and ER nurses about BiPAP, CPAP, blood gases, ventilators, just like a gamut of different things. And then on top of it, hypoxic drive theory. So that's what I'm trying to get with that. The hypoxic drive theory. Check in the description. I'll give you the, the uh, minutes and seconds to where you can skip right to that if you want. You can listen to Jimmy's version of the hypoxic drive theory. I've got some really poor drawings that I'll do for sure. But uh, without further ado, let's get to the RT clinic. So first of all, let's talk about arterial blood gases. So there are some real key components to arterial blood gases. Now in school, you had to know, of course, is this partially uncompensated respiratory acidosis and all this other stuff. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to talk about the clinical applications. And so blood gases, we hope, are going to be a little different in Clinton next year because we've budgeted for some iStats. And if you're familiar with iStat, it is a handheld device and it actually runs the blood gas right there in the room. Now, we, if you lay the iStat next to the desktop machine, the desktop machine is actually faster, which is kind of sad, but it is faster, but those results have to go from there, be taken down to the ER or the physician or whatever, or, or the nurse, or they have to be transmitted in. It's really nice to have those values right there so when they come up, you can look at them. It makes everybody feel all warm inside. So the one thing an iStat cannot do, it cannot do co-oximetry. So we'll talk about co-oximetry a little bit. There'll be a machine to do that. We rarely need specific co-oximetry, but we'll talk about the, the instances. So I will open a lot of questions. If you have an answer, please answer. I will not openly make fun of you if you get it wrong. It's okay. You have a lot of, a lot of minds in here. So I think we're gonna have a lot of answers to questions. So first of all, let's look at blood gases. Just a quick review. Um, as with any of my stuff, if you're ever interested in more, this is my personal plug, I do have a YouTube page, it's called RT Clinic. It's got over 3,100 uh, subscribers, and uh, I go through all of this stuff in smaller sections, but it's very similar to that. So if you're ever like, gosh, I just, I can't go to sleep tonight, I wanna listen to Jimmy's nasally voice, do hit it, and then you can crash out while I talk for an hour and a half. Yeah, so. All right, anyway, all that stuff's on there. I also address some other things too. Um, the, my most watched videos are how to use a Venturi mask, and it's watched across the world, actually. I've got a big following in Saudi Arabia, which is kind of weird. <laughs> so, but there's a lot of respiratory therapists over there, and they, they've kind of disseminated my videos in that area, which is neat. So Venturi mask, how to run on her breather, how to hook up a flow meter, um, use a flutter, and all those other kind of funky devices, a proper use of an IS. Um, so those are things that you probably get a real small amount in nursing school when you learn to rest on the job. Well, there's a lot of first, second, third year nurses that haven't really learned it well. So this is a good way for them to go back and review it. So, all right, let's talk about blood gases first of all. So there's some really important aspects of a blood gas. Some of these questions I'm gonna ask you, you're gonna be like, this is ridiculously easy, but I just like covering all the bases. All right, so, there's four major components of a blood gas, um, pH, PaCO2, PaO2, and bicarb. Does anybody know what that little A stands for right here? What does that mean? Arterial. Arterial, great. So you could have a PVO2 if we're looking at some hemodynamic stuff, but the little A means arterial. We're gonna go into something uh, a little later, which is my like my specialty that I love talking about, and that's P big AO2. And I think it's, it's really good for you guys as being uh, nurses that are involved in critical care. So we'll talk about that a little later, but notice the, the big A versus the little A, something totally different. So first of all, we're reporting a blood gas. We're gonna say, when we report them out, we report them like this, 7, 2, 5, 50, 90, and 24. So shorthand for <clears throat> pH, PCO2, PaO2, and bicarb. So we all pretty much understand that when you're giving blood gases. So that's that's all great, but let's 
look at normal values to kind of go back to know what our normals are for these. So, what's our normal for pH? 7.35, 7.45. Great. Actually, let me just go through this a little bit different because I'll just do it like a standard teaching style of it. Okay, what's our normal PaCO2? 35 to 45. How is that measured? Getting technical, but actually it does make, it, you need to know, it makes, it makes some sense with it. What's the, what's the unit of measure on that? Millimeters of mercury. Perfect, so because it's partial pressure, it's millimeters of mercury. So a lot of times we get really hung up on volumes and percentages in medicine where this is millimeters of mercury this will come into a play a little bit later but when you start using when you know the units of something you know that the max is not a hundred so it can go way higher than a hundred if need be PaO2 now I'm gonna put a little star on this bad boy because this means what is the normal on room air what is the normal on room air I don't have anybody on room air. 80 to 100. 80 to 100, yes. 80 to 100 is normal room air. And uh, I'll go through the explanation. That's also millimeters of mercury. I'll go through the explanation later about why that's normal and then how much it changes as it goes up. HCO3 negative. So bicarb, what's normal bicarb? Uh, yeah, it kind of varies. Usually 20, we're going to say 22 to 26. Okay. So, and that's millimoles per liter. So, that's more of a volume measurement. Okay, so reading the blood gas, we'll go through this first, we'll kind of buzz through it. So if we're looking at something that's below 735, is that acidotic or alkalotic? Acid. Acid. And then this one's alk. So a, a CO2 below 35, does that cause an acidosis or an alkalosis? Alkalosis. Alkalosis, great. And acidosis. This, this bad boy right here, we put it on every blood gas, but it has nothing to do with acid-base balance. It's just an assessment of oxygenation. And um, when I get into it later, it's an assessment of reserve oxygenation. And then below uh, 22 bicarb acidosis or alkalosis. Acidosis. Acidosis. And then above is alkalosis. Perfect. So if I give you numbers, and this is just kind of go back a little bit, refresher from school. So I'll give you these numbers. If we want to give this thing a name, we go through each one of these and call it acid, alk, or normal. So this would be acid, this would be acid, this is normal, and this is normal. Okay, and then we name all our blood gases backwards. So whatever the pH says, I'm going fast, but this is just for time purposes. Whatever the pH says goes right here. This op the options in this, in this category here are respiratory or metabolic. So whichever system, obviously CO2 is respiratory, this side is metabolic, whichever system matches the pH with the acidosis or the alkalosis, who we blame it on, so who we freaking blame with. And then this is, this last one is, are we getting help from the other side? So from the other side of the, of the teeter-totter going on here, are we getting help from the metabolic side? In this case, are we getting help? No. No, so this is called a Uncompensated. Very good. Uncompensated. Excellent job. This wife is a respiratory therapy instructor at Ivy Tech. No, so. seriously, has nothing to do with that. I'm just trying to get out of here so I can go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. I appreciate your answer to the question. So, <laughs> you'll come quick today. What's that? You'll come quick today. Okay. <laughs> so, uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Usually, we could call this like, um, we also, if you're looking at this, Call this respiratory failure. We call it acute respiratory failure. So another way you may see physicians call it things, or if you want to sound really smart, you can do it that way too. Because <laughs> that's what 90% of this is, is sounding smart. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some keys later about how to sound smart. So let's do another one.
kind of funky blood gas. Definitely something you can see in the ER. Definitely something you see that somebody, um, I'll talk about the situation in a second, but let's read the blood gas first of all. Get rid of a ton of these. This is out, this is out, this is normal, this is acid. So I remember we, we named these bad boys. It's the alkalosis. Who do we blame it on? Respiratory. Respiratory because they match, right? So it's respiratory. And then are we getting compensation? Partially. partially. Yes, but it's partial. So um, <clears throat> that's partially compensated respiratory alkalosis. Give me, now here, this will connect to the clinical. Give me an example of a, a disease process or a patient history who might have this. Anxiety and hyperventilation. Yeah, usually anxiety and hyperventilation, I'll just think about pain. So if they're in pain for a long period of time and they come in there and rest for alkalosis, remember this happened first before this guy started dropping. But there's one real big key about bicarb. Bicarb moves very, very slow. So uh, CO2 can move quickly, bicarb moves slow. So this, isn't, this hasn't been going on for five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. It's probably more like a few hours that they've been hyperventilating in this case. Another one, another instance of just a, uh, so we have our anxiety, we have our pain. What's our, what's another one? It's even a little bit, that's a little bit more of a, a ominous sign. So early asthma. So you have somebody with an early asthma attack, they will initially present as respiratory alkalosis. And what will happen with early asthma is they'll have a respiratory alkalosis because they're compensating. And it's not always necessarily compensating for their CO2 being high, but they have airways are starting to close down and start inflammation. And then what happens over time is this PaO2 starts to fall where they can no longer compensate and keep their oxygen up. When the PaO2 falls, you start having, you start, your cells are going into respiration that's not aerobic respiration, but there's lack of oxygen. So you have anaerobic respiration, which what, what is released in that case? lactic acid which causes this dude to fall here so and that's really the fall that you get uh when you have somebody in early asthma attack you'll see this respiratory alkalosis and you, their lungs are tight and they're working really hard but they're gonna wear out and when they do they're gonna crash really fast but they won't initially always present like a cob patient presents with a high co2 and and everything else so something good to think about from the er perspective what are some medications we might give to patients that are in acute a asthma exacerbation? Albuterol. Albuterol is the first one, usually a continuous treatment. So um, a normal treatment of albuterol is 2.5 milligrams. Common is very common to give 10 milligrams over an hour. Um, when I did some clinicals at Wishard ER, they had a they had a great protocol, which I'd really like to get started, but everybody's a little bit afraid of it. But they would give, um, they would give five, five, and five, all back. Oh, so a double, a double, and a double in a standard neb. So they give them a double. So it gets done again, a double. And what it does is really, really effective because if somebody's really tight, it does absolutely nothing just to throw two point five milligrams at them that you've been giving them. They've been taking every four hours for the last thirty years. So increasing and having an escalating dose of albuterol is really important, but what's a major problem of an escalating dose of albuterol? Tachycardia and hypokalemia. So you'll see both of those kind of manifest, but what are we worried about? We're worried about them closing off. So that's something I'd really like to, in the future, get way more aggressive on ER as far as giving large doses of albuterol to not, instead of just, you know, give them, get them over a little bit of a hump, no, break them open, get them to the point where they're like doing this, they're shaking from the side effects, but they can breathe because the side effects will go away. That's a normal effect of albuterol. It is a, it is a refined form of epinephrine, that's all it is. The epinephrine broke down to small pieces and gave them to the lungs. So in the future, I'd like to get to a protocol where we give some really high doses. We'll watch for tachycardia and the hypokalemia is not usually enough to cause any, it's not enough to cause any uh, major ectopy, but um, we need to open them up in those cases. So we got albuterol. Let's say albuterol is not working with another option. What is it? Good. Yeah, but that's really if you're if you're using HFA, if they're an exacerbation, 
they're not going to be able to maintain that normal breathing pattern for an HFA. Mm -hmm. But this is another delivery for albuterol. What's another medication that might be suggested? Steroids. Steroids, yeah, definitely, because right. you're dealing with inflammation. And you can throw inhaled corticosteroids at them, but IV steroids work faster. And so, you know, I think with asthma is that, you know, it's just like if you get a cut on your arm and you get swelling around that area, that swelling uh, can sometimes, you know, cause a, a raised area and whatnot. In your airways the same way, but your swelling your airways just cause them to do this. And if you have true asthma exacerbation that's, uh, that has an allergic aspect to it, you can throw albuterol at it all day. All albuterol does is it affects the muscles surrounding it, but you gotta have steroids to reduce the inflammation because then you can make the lumen larger steroids. So albuterol, big dose albuterol, IV steroids, what is like our kind of our last ditch effort? Epi-Up. Epi-Up. Yeah, those are, those are hardcore. So you have Epi up here, Fibrinoline slightly reformed, you have albuterol and you have Zopinex back in the day. So you could do that. There's another medication though. Ketamine. Ketamine and two of them. You can chill them out with ketamine, you could. <laughs> it's bronchodilate. It is. It could bronchodilate too. I've been given asthma that hasn't given ketamine over there. Yeah. Mag. Mag is the one. Smooth muscle. Oh, yeah. A gross, smooth yeah. muscle relaxant. If you get a patient that you got to get to mag, keep an eye on them because that's kind of like we got to the end there and ketamine also obviously but a lot of them we follow that pathway and treatment so it's just things to think about that was a rabbit trail but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me just give one more common one that you may see oh let's see this is interesting guy <laughs> that will be forever on video. <laughs> but that's real, it's real life. Yeah. So, it's real life. So, all right, I made these numbers up. They're not absolutely perfect. People on YouTube have said before, those don't make sense. It's for, we're suspending a little bit of reality here. But they make a sense when we're looking at a name in this blood gas. So, uh, what are we going to call this one? Respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis, good. What about our compensation side? Partially. Partially. Partially, good. Partially compensated. Nope, not on here. Okay. So tell me, tell me a little bit about, about the, what you may suspect the history on this patient is. COPD, good. And we'll talk about COPD in just a second. So definitely, probably COPD. <clears throat> this is, and if you're going to look at this from the outside, you're going to say, this is acute on chronic respiratory failure. And why do I know it's a chronic respiratory failure? Because you don't get this dude overnight. This takes years and years of Marlboro Reds to get to this point. Right? <laughs> Not always Marlboro Reds, but it could be. So you got to really work on this because... The cool thing is about our body, when we were made, when God made us at the beginning, he was like, they're going to trash their lungs. I know it. So I'm going to get this backup system so they're going to be okay. That's this. That's the bicarb level. And that's controlled by what organ? The kidneys. And the kidney either, either releasing, excreting hydrogen or holding on to hydrogen, all controlled by the kidneys. So anyway, so this is going to be your partial kinds of respiratory acidosis. This is some kind of obstructive disorder. When we say COPD, obstructive disorder. So this is pretty bad, but they're exacerbated on top of it. How do I know? Because their pH is out of whack. So what we a common treatment for this patient? Now we have there'd be a lot of things that come into play, but what might be something we would try? Antibiotics. Oh, before that. <laughs> Antibiotics would probably be somewhere in the in the range. What'd you say? Steroids, definitely somewhere. What about respiratory support? BiPAP. So BiPAP is very common in this. So, so this could be definitely a BiPAP patient. We'll talk a little bit about BiPAP in a second. Uh, BiPAP would definitely be an option for this, along with steroids because they're going to have gross inflammation, along with probably antibiotics at some point if they have something showing up on their chest, chest X-ray. So BiPAP is definitely an option. At what point, if I hand you this blood gas now as Clinicians, we're not physicians, but and we can't diagnose. 
But at what point would you think that this patient might need intubated? Because that's kind of a thing in here, and it's a pretty junky uh, pH. What are some things you might notice that would make you think, BiHap's not gonna work for this person? Anxiety level. Anxiety level, yes, so. So, are they even going to tolerate the thing? Because if they don't, then we'll talk about BiPAP, but it's, it augments their spontaneous tidal volume. So if they're breathing really fast and they're not willing, or they never wore one before, they're not willing to, to work with it, it's only going to it's only gonna delay the inevitable. So anxiety level is one. I didn't give you a lot of history on the patient. What are the types of like vital signs would you be super concerned about? Respiratory rate. Respiratory rate. If this respiratory rate was below normal in any way, shape, or form, no BiPAP. Yeah. Because BiPAP augments a volume, it does not augment a rate. If we augment a rate, we go to the other machine on the other side, which is the net. So many times the rate's low, and I've seen physicians do this before and it burns me, but they'll say the patient came in, maybe they took too much medication, put them on BiPAP, and their respiratory rate eight. BiPAP does not augment rate, it only augments volume. So they have to need a ventilator in those cases. So, so a respiratory rate. Uh, and just overall appearance too. I mean, if this patient is really working at this, because they could be, and one of the common things, we see tripod and we see purslet breathing. Those are all fine things, but when they've been doing that for hours, they're gonna wear out. So it's much better to catch them early, maybe with a BiPAP early, but when you start sensing anything else, it, it's you need to go to the vent because you don't want this patient to crash and they, they can quickly. Now, if I get another blood gas, so let's say our, we opt for BiPAP. This is going to be kind of a judgment call. Um, but let's say I get another blood gas in 30 minutes. And this is the blood gas in 30 minutes. So is the BiPAP working? Yes. Is it working enough? Not there yet, but this patient might be kind of hard to turn around. Uh, so it's working, maybe not working enough, and this is where you're gonna look back at your vital signs and say, okay, is this patient still working? Can they maybe speak in full sentences now? Are there, are there lung sounds actually, are they actually opening up a little bit? And that would tell you to we need to stay on the BiPAP in that case instead of going to vent. If at any time you do a blood gas and this guy right here does not change and especially go up in 30 minutes, you failed, absolutely failed. Or if you get to this point right here and any of those symptoms have not decreased enough and they still look like this, you, I mean, this, at this gas when they came in, you, you failed. You have to go to a ventilator at that point. So it, it's, you can only do that for so long and people can say, we don't want to put the CLPD on the vent. We'll put, but the CLPD is going to die if you don't put them on the vent. So that's there comes a point in there. So your blood gas, you need to see marked decrease each time with this. Okay. So there's one person that may be like, well, Jimmy, I don't want to take them to 40, a 40 PCO2, right? I don't want to like blow it all the way off because they work really hard to get this. I mean, <laughs> if we don't, because they'll become, if we take this to 40, what happens to their, their pH? It's going to be alkalotic. Alkalotic. So it's like a 7.53, it's totally made up. Because this, remember, this moves really slow. It's going to be 44. So now they're in a respiratory, actually, they're in a an uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. And you're like, gosh, why would that ever happen to this? It does a lot. So there's a really cool equation. And so I've got some equations today. And this one actually just is kind of near and dear to my heart a little bit because I was taught this by Dr. Tierdom, late Dr. Tierdom. So when I was in respiratory therapy school, down, I was at regional, he was there. And so it actually calculates this number right here, what would be normal. So if you have a patient comes in and they have a 45 bicarb, you can calculate what their normal CO2 would be to make 7.40, because that's all this is, is a balancing beam. So you take their bicarb, 
45 times uh, 1.5, and then you add 8 to all of that. Those, these are two knowns, and you put the CO2 in there. So does anybody have a calculator on? I, I'm not going to do my head, so I'm going to do it with head. 1.5 times 45 plus 8. Still so like 80. 75. 75. 75. 75.5. So technically, if he wasn't, he went down to 75 from here for the 45, he would be 7.40. So that's a way to calculate what where their CO2 needs to get to to get them at normal pH. That's like that's like you're working ER and you got one patient and you can start sitting down <laughs> calculating stuff because you want to sound really smart and report. So. I mean, you don't always get that opportunity, but that's just something to think about. The 1.5 times the bicarb plus 8 tells you what CO2 needs to be to make a 7.40. Because we're not gonna we're not gonna deal with this right now. I mean, this is the body's done this, and uh, it will do it again as they hypoventilate after we take them off of it. But it happens when it happens slow, you don't have any problems. It's just when it happens fast, the bicarb cannot keep up. At what point do we knock off their drive? That's a good one. With the COPD. Uh, with oxygen? So, it totally varies. Um, I will talk about, do you want me to talk about hypoxic drive theory? Real quick. I mean, it's really kind of cool. It's cool. It is it's absolutely a theory. Some people do not believe in it at all, but I'll, I'll give you my two cents on it. And it's exactly like what Larry was saying. And a lot of people will be like, they have COPD. Don't give them oxygen. I've seen it happen before. And the mm -hmm. person sat in 82. Don't give them oxygen. Don't give them too much oxygen. They're sat in, they're sat in 70 on a cannula. We put them on 900 breather. They go up to 85 and they want to wean it. But no, no, they need oxygen. You got to get to a certain point. So hypoxic drive, and it is a theory, but this is this is kind of how it works. So I, I don't draw this really well. Okay, this is the brain. This is brain stem, and then we have some lungs down here, um, and we have like a, a heart right here. So that's what it looks like. So, so what is our normal drive to breathe? We run off of what what's, what we, what we call the system, our drive to breathe. CO two. CO two. So we actually. Um, and technically it's hypercarbic drive. So when CO2 rises, it says it sends a signal from your brain stem down to your diaphragm down here and says breathe, 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 breathe. Large muscle there, you start breathing. So that's usually what it is. Hypercarbic drive is what we all run off of. So CO2 rises and then we do it. Now, is it CO2 or is it just acidosis? Because that's kind of funky because think about this. If your, if your arterial blood is acidotic, either metabolic or respiratory, the response is breathe fast. DKA, breathe fast. Uh, high CO2 because your, hypo, your respiratory failure, breathe fast. The trigger's all that. So it's sending that signal down here, but that's the hypercarbic drive. This is the problem. I like to think of it, and when I draw hearts, I draw box hearts because I'm not like to draw hearts. So, you guys, this will be super easy for you. What do these two dots represent? SA and AV node. Very good. SA node, AV node. Right? So, what's an SA node rate? What is it? What is a normal day? What's it kicking at? 80. 80. Let's just say 80. When you get a problem and you get a connection in here that gets cut, and you're running off AV rate, what's your AV rate? 40, 60. 40, get you by until somebody can get a pacemaker in you, right? Another backup system. That's exactly how I see the hypercarbic versus the hypoxic drive. So you have your SA node and AV node. So if Hillary's sitting here and she has, for many years, she has a blood gas like, to 80. She has a blood gas like this, a normal blood gas for her, for years. High CO2. More like Willie Nelson's. Willie Nelson's. He might be a little bit higher. Yeah. yeah we've got. We we have. We got. We we have some people in Terre Haute who run normally 90. 
So when they come in, when they exacerbate, they're over 100. I never had seen a PCO2 over 100 until the last four years. And we got them 110, 150, 150. Usually I run my toe and they go really bad. But So this is fully compensated. So you have the CO2 receptors for your hypercarbic drive, but what happens when you stimulate, 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 stimulate almost chronically? What happens when you do that to receptors? They don't work as well. So we the backup system is hypoxic receptors. So they're receptors that when your oxygen level gets low, it triggers you to breathe. So what, what the hypoxic drive theory is, it's absolutely, and it's not a theory, I've seen it happen. So is you burn out these, we don't know what point somebody does that though, that's the problem. Because some people may not have that, but they burn out these because of this, and now you run off of a hypoxic drive. So if I give this patient too much oxygen and they go to sleep, they will no longer get the signal from these guys right here to breathe while you're asleep. It's autonomic type of thing, but it's controlled by CO2 normally. But in the case where these are burnt, which you really don't know, I mean, you could say, well, if their bicarb's elevated chronically, it's burnt. You don't know that for sure. It's different with every patient. So that's why we mind the amount of oxygen we give these patients and don't give them anything excessive. So to oxygenate somebody in most cases is absolutely simple if they have good lungs. We do this a lot, and I don't know if we've done it up here, but when we do a harvest with um, IOPO, we've got a, a strategy that we use with this, and it's we're testing function of the brain stem. It's like one of the, you know, you do a lot of tests. This is the final function. Has anybody ever done one of those before? It's, it's amazing to watch. I mean, so the patient's essentially has been declared dead, but what we do, we just brain stem function test. So we take them off the ventilator, we take a piece of oxygen tubing, like a cannula, we cut it off, so it's just a, a, an end, and we slide it down their ET tube, and we turn it on to like six liters. And what, what we'll actually do is we'll draw a blood gas when we first start it. So we draw a blood gas when we first start it, and let's say their blood gas is, um, they probably don't like them to be acidotic at all. Um, so that would be 24. So there's our first blood gas. We take them off the ventilator, we put this oxygen tube down, and let's say they're sad this time. It's really, it's really connects so many dots when you see this. Their sad's 98%, or let's say it's a little lower, but that's okay. Slide the oxygen tube down, six liters, and they sit there for 15 minutes. And they may have some agonal respirations and things like that. But what we're actually doing is testing to see if their brain stem's functioning. The cool thing is, 15 minutes later, they are static. You'll have, I mean, it might be lower. Your PaO2 goes up because all you're doing is increasing the partial pressure of oxygen in their alveoli and it automatically diffuses across if they breathe or not. But in this case, when we see this, we know this boy doesn't work anymore because we've tested their brain stem by increasing their CO2 and they never took a breath. And that's how we determine brain death. That's the cool thing about the oxygen versus CO2 when we're looking at that. So all of that to say, if somebody has, is the potential to, to hold on CO2 chronically, we wanna make sure that we keep their oxygen level in the low 90s to upper 80s at all times. If you turn it up, funky thing is, if you start turning their oxygen up and they're on six liters and they're sat at 98% and you go draw a blood gas, their CO2, which makes no sense except for this, by this theory, will start to rise because they will not start taking adequate breaths like they should because we're, we're saying we're hitting these hypoxic drive receptors and saying everything's all good. You can slow your breathing down if it's rate, if it's volume or things like that. That's where you're gonna see it first. Now, there has been stories about patients like going and turning their own oxygen up at night and coding and dying. I don't know. There's a story about that at, at, at the main hospital, but um, it could definitely happen. Um, so 
that's hypothetic drive theory. Um, you never heard that before? Yeah. I didn't realize it was a theory. I thought it, that, it, that was accepted. It, um, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. That a lot of people will call it theory, but honestly, I didn't, I didn't believe it because it was hard to connect the dots when I was in respiratory school until I had a patient that I extubated in the old ICU and we had him on a lot of oxygen and we did the first gas and the gas was terrible. And I called Dr. Uh, Chirum at the time and I said, I said, here's the gas. I said, you want me to reintubate him? And he said, no, take him off oxygen. And I was like, come on, man. Take him off oxygen. I mean, they're gas, but they're very acidotic. Of course, <laughs> they started breathing <laughs> and they were fine. So um, anyway, I was a believer from then on. But you'll get some people that don't believe it. All right, so let's look at a blood gas and look at some other kind of um, other settings too. Actually, let's look at oxygenation first. We'll go into that a little bit. So let's look at oxygenation. So we know about our acid base balance. We talked about that a little bit. Um, let's look at when we give oxygen to a patient. So this is a there's a there's a big equation for this. Don't write this down, but it's it actually is is really interesting. This is our big like equation that we use in respiratory. Well, some people do. Um, wish you got school and didn't care about this stuff, but most most of the time. But this is the this figure is that P big A O two. And you might be thinking, why, Jimmy, are you telling us about this? But there's a good reason. So P big AO2 is the concentration of oxygen in your alveoli, which is extremely important if you're giving anybody oxygen. Now, oxygen is a drug. Um, we first right therapists kind of make a big deal about it. It's, you give them a drug and stuff like that. But I mean, it really is because there are some things that can't help and hurt them with this. So what this equation essentially says is this is barometric pressure minus 47 which is a known that's actually uh the concentration of water in in air at sea level this is 1.25 times their co2 which is just saying okay there's two types of gases in here there's oxygen and there's going to be co2 and this kind of takes out the co2 so we look at our arterial system here and our arterial system on room air is normal is 80 to 100. no meters of mercury so that's cool. So, but on room air, we put, okay, so what's the barometric pressure at sea level? There's two answers. Larry knows this one. I know he does. You got a 760 right. or one atmosphere is the easiest one. So 760 at sea level. This will make sense in a second as a cool kind of connection. So 713 times FiO2 is 0.21, and we just put a normal 40 in here. That would figure up to be about 105-ish available in the oxygen. I call this available oxygen. On room air, right now at sea level, that's what we're breathing. Makes sense that normal is 80 to 100 in the alveolar system. Perfect, right? Go to the cross, just like it should. But every time you add supplemental oxygen to somebody, you are changing this right here. And so when you report a PaO2 level, it's very important that you always report how much oxygen they're on. So, Jenny, somebody comes in with chest pain, how much oxygen do you put them on? Two liters. Two liters. Okay, let's figure this thing for two liters. Somebody have a calculator here. Kale, do you want to do that? So we're going to figure it for two liters. Two liters is 0.28% or 28%. So let's do 713 times 0.28. Minus 50. We'll just put a 50 in here because that's usually what that comes out to be. Seven thirteen times point two eight minus fifty. Wait, 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 wait too many clicks over there. I mean, 149. <laughs> so, 149 in here. So, what would you expect to see in our arterial system? 
149, right? I mean, you expect it to come across to 149. So their PaO2 should be 149. Now, we see a PaO2 149 and we think, oh my gosh, that's too high or this or that. Take this, take this into account. Figure it again, Kale, for five liters. Let's do a five liter cannula, which five liters is 40%. So 0 0.4 here, 713 times 0.4 minus 50. Two thirty-five. So I do a blood gas on your patient on five liters. Tell me how many times this has got you, because it, it, it gets everybody. So I do a blood gas on your patient on five liters, and you say their oxygenation is great. Mm -hmm. Well, there, it really isn't because 235 here, 110 here. Do you know what that, that number is considered? That's considered your, I know they used to do it on the vents, your PF ratio. Like your big A to little A, your PF ratio. So there's a problem with getting things across from here to here. So every time you see a PaO2, do not believe it until you know what their oxygen delivered is. The only time I believe PaO2 is usually on the rim air. So there's a problem here. What would cause, or what would stop oxygen from diffusing from the alveoli to the blood? Vaping. Vaping, the <laughs> biggest thing in the world, yeah. Vaping, I'm the anti-vape, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> so they've asked me, I don't know how many times you talk on WKHI about vape. So we had, which I've done, but I feel like I'm getting a little bit slower, overkill. But we had some kids come in the other day that were third graders. And they asked me to talk about vaping, and I just I went totally scared straight on them. I said, there's been some people come in here that have vaped, and even all this stuff that we can do for respiratory might not help you. You might die. And that was it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. So anyway, it's really not totally true. But there are some very – so do you know what the vaping problem is? I mean, it's, it's an additive, and the additive is very similar to what used to be called popcorn lung which was which they diagnosed from a person who was working in a factory and he had microwave popcorn every single day and he used to have this acetate in it and microwave popcorn and he actually got a lung disorder from it and they linked it to that they've now taken it out of, of microwave popcorn but this stuff is actually being used to add in those flavors bad stuff straight points the, the, the key is don't ever inhale anything that you don't know where it came from so vaping's one, yes. yes. So vaping actually, so there's nine layers of tissue here. Anytime you increase this thickness there, it's a bad day. What else can cause it? A yes, ARDS, it's just gross inflammation. So that's inflammation of all this area. It's make it harder to get stuff across. ARDS, definitely. PE, CHF. Yes, CHF, fluid, PE, you got blockage, big blockage right here. Yeah, so that definitely those again. So the so this is the term that I'm gonna give you to use, and there's too many of you in here, it's not gonna work, but this term is really good. I tell the nursing students, and I think I've only, I mean, in like six years I've done this, a VQ mismatch. So VQ mismatch is one of those great terms that you can use in oxygenation. Like if you are in Sunday school and you fall asleep and they call on you and say, What's the answer to that, Jimmy? And you go, Jesus, and you usually can be right if you say that. Or you say, pray more. That was probably right, too. You probably get, That's what VQ mismatch is in these situations. Because VQ mismatch is ventilation versus perfusion mismatch. Is PE that? Yes. Is ARDS that? Yes. Is pneumonia that? Yes. Is CHF that? Yes. Everything's a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So my challenge to students is, is when they come and they're following you guys around, somebody has a low oxygen, and they, you ask them a question, they're just going to say, it's possible that this is a VQ mismatch of some type. But nobody <laughs> will say that. <laughs> students won't do that. Because I want them to like say that. So you're like, well, what the crap are you talking about? Because <laughs> it's really a catch-all for any type of oxygenation issue. So anyway, VQ mismatch. So that's the problem. So definitely know that how much oxygen you're delivering is going to affect this number right here. Okay. So let's get into some really cool numbers. Because... Is anybody a runner in here? <laughs> runner. So, Larry, if you were a, uh, what they call world-class runners, 
Where might you go to train if you're a world class runner? Oh, high up, high. High altitudes. Okay, let's let's look at that real quick. So let's do a high altitude thing. Why do you go to the high altitudes? So we take this barometric pressure and we change it. So if we figure this and figure this one for me, Kale, I think in the upper Rocky Mountains like Pikes Peak, I'm thinking we're we're running like a 745 up there, barometric pressure. They say the air is thinner, but it actually has a lower pressure. So 745 minus 47. So that is 698 times 0 0.21 room air that we breathe minus 50. 96. 96. Available oxygen up there is 96. This will make sense in a second, not just for runners. So available oxygen is 96. Can't get any higher on here up there. What is your, so the best you can get in here is 96 on a good day. So really your, your normal is 96 to 86. What does your body do to compensate for that? Breathe faster. Could breathe faster. Or deeper. Could breathe slower. Not the right answer yet, but pretty close. Breathe deeper. Breathe deeper. <laughs> <laughs> breathe deeper. Yes, something happens in your blood. You become polycythemic. Yeah. <laughs> right after breathe, yeah. breathe longer. <laughs> so, exhale longer. Uh, so, you become more polycythemic because you get more hemoglobin red blood cells to bind the oxygen, take it to the tissues. Very, very important. So, a cool number is, and I've done, I've done this, the math with this before. Everest. So, you've probably seen the movies, go climb the Everest, you know, Short, fat, bald Jimmy just doesn't run up the side of Everest and go for it, right? Because you can't. You got to train for all these years. You got to be tough. You got to be. You got to have a really tough body, and not anything else. You have to have very efficient lungs. Can you guess what the top of Everest is? Twenty thousand. All of us right now, dead. You're not gonna make it. Sorry. Twenty nine, we die. But what? What happens up on well, for those people? And uh, so what they do, for one, they train for it. So they don't just go shh all up to the top and say, here we are, we're getting back down. No, they go up and they do a little base camp. They base camp, base camp. This makes sense in a second. They come up here, they become more polycythemic, they wait. They come up here, more polycythemic, they wait. Until they get up to the top and they've got so much hemoglobin that any amount of oxygen, PaO2, PaO2 is dissolved oxygen, can bind the hemoglobin and they can oxygenate up there. What are some other things they use if they're training? Steroids. They use dexamethasone when they go up there to reduce any kind of inflammation in here and make this real thin so this all goes across and it gets bound to hemoglobin. So, such, so it's, this is, I'm sorry, I can talk on this for a little bit. Let's go a little bit farther. What patients do we have like that? Our COP patients. How do we know how long they've been there? They're polycythemic. Because they're living in a chronic hypoxic state, and so that's why their hemoglobin is up to compensate for that and take it to the tissues. There's another equation. Now don't write this down at all. But I just I want to show you the relationship between two things. Now we've all we all know this relationship. And we know which one's more important, but I'm just going to kind of show you a little bit about how to use PaO2. Okay, so this equation says CaO2 times, this is 1.34 times hemoglobin times SAT plus PaO2 times 0 0.003. So we have two sides of this equation. CaO2 is how well we're oxygenating the tissues. So we got to have a normal CaO2 level to oxygenate tissues well. If we're gonna just break this in two sides, what side of this equation is way more important than the other side? Left side or the right side? Is hemoglobin and SAT more important than PaO2? Absolutely, all day long, right? Because what do we take our PaO2? We multiply it times this little number over here. So how is this proven in the ER? And so this, well, let me get to this first. 
this is how that PEO2 difference between bound hemoglobin. So you, in your in your blood, you got these things floating around. This is your hemoglobin, and they combine. Different thing. And also in your arterial blood floating around, you have these little dots. And all this is is dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is PaO2. It's unbound. So how do we oxygenate our tissues? We have to bind to hemoglobin. So we have to have the hemoglobin and we have to have a saturated. So if anybody ever asks you which is most important in oxygenating tissues, hemoglobin and sat, never PaO2. One time when we can solely prove that is one instance that comes into the ER. And what's the one instance that comes into the ER that you do not trust your pulse oximeter with? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide poisoning because if you have CO poisoning, you have your blood floating through here, and a pulse ox looks at is something bound to hemoglobin. It doesn't know if it's oxygen, carbon monoxide, or a methyl group, methyl hemoglobinemia. It doesn't know the difference. So if you got CO bound here, it doesn't know. But guess what? You put this patient on non rebreather. Your PaO2 on under breather is probably 600. And that's what, if I put any of y'all on under breather right now, it would be about 650 to 660 if you had normal lungs after 30 minutes. Your dissolved oxygen is going to be in the 600, but you're, you're going to have a couple different things on your blood gas. And this kind of goes back to the co-oximeter, which we're going to have. So when you need to run a co-oximeter, it's going to break. It's going to give you three values, and so it's really good to know these values. It's going to break your hemoglobin up, and it's going to say, what percentage of my hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it? What percent has CO bound to it? What percent has methyl bound to it? These will all add up to be 100%. You're going to see this coming from a co-ox, and you're not going to want it on every patient. You get on every blood gas now, but you're going to want to know this. So normal CO... And no matter how healthy you are, everybody has less than 2% usually. So if you're a smoker, this can go up to 10 or so. But think about this. If this is 10, that means the maximum this could be would be 90. And this is usually less than 1% in the methyl group. So the maximum this could be 89% if you're, and that's why smoking causes you to be hypoxic because you're taking spots of your hemoglobin and blocking it with CO. Now, if your patient comes into the ER and they it's a firefighter from a from a fire, and this is there's a lot of cutoff levels that I've heard before, but 20 is a really bad one. If the carb, if the carbon dioxide level is 20, really all we can do here is give 100 oxygen. We can try some CPAP stuff and things like that, but the maximum this thing could be would be 80. Now their PaO2 will read 600, but just know. That has their oxygenation is sucks at that time. It's absolutely terrible because this is their actual saturation. So don't believe the PaO2 in those cases because you got a ton of dissolved. But remember, we got to take that to oxygenate tissues. We got to do that 600 times 0 0.003 to get that side of the equation. So that's why you can do that. Now, what is another option? This be a little bit out of the box. What would be another option if you had somebody that came with a smoke inhalation and their carboxy was high? Carbon dioxide poisoning. We don't have the availability here. We do in Terre Haute, though. The hyperbaric. Hyperbaric. hyperbaric chamber. So this is like Jimmy's bucket list, what I'd love to do. I'd love to go inside the hyperbaric when they sink somebody down two atmospheres and draw blood gas on them. I mean, she won't read it, but hyperbaric takes the maximum of 660 here and doubles it. So let's just say 1300. You'd have 1300 pressure inside your, you know, so it infuses oxygen in, and that would help to knock this off. Would so, ECMO work? ECMO would work. Yeah, ECMO would work. Pulling it off and taking and uh, re-oxygenating, but the fastest thing would be hyperbaric. I remember Gamble, Gamble used to work in Terre Haute. He, I remember him talking about that. He said, whenever we get somebody 20, I want to go and sink them in the, sink them in the uh, hyperbaric chamber. I don't want to be that patient, but that'd be a cool day when that happens because it will really convert them quick. Because you just hyper them. 
So there is an ECMO option that you guys probably don't know about. We purchased a, a device two years ago for a lot of money, and it's called a Cardio Help. Has anyone ever seen Cardio Help? Cardio Help is it's on a it's on a rack about this big, and it is heart lung bypass portable heart lung bypass machine. It's never been used. Um, so we're getting to the point where we're getting close to using it two years later. Um, but it actually can do uh, A to V uh, bypass. It's got an oxygen flow meter on it. It's got this big cartridge that costs, I think, five grand for once, but I mean, you're saving somebody's life with it. So uh, the cartridge, and then you're gonna run that through and it does heart lung bypass. The cool thing is, is that when the helicopter shows up, they have the option, they have that ability where we can take that cartridge and stick it in theirs. The problem we find is finding a position that will put large enough, the large enough catheters in people for this to work. But there is that option. So you may hear about that in the future, but it's a great thing for heart lung bypass. I'll tell you what. Okay, so let's talk about the ventilator just a little bit. I'll try to some blood gases into this also. This is a our Drager V500, and you guys have a special one because we have these in Turbo too, but they have an extra box on the bottom, which is an air compressor. So you really only have to hook up oxygen for this thing to run. So um, some different things, and some of this stuff might be really easy for you, but let me shut it off real quick. Notice when I shut it off, <clears throat> when I shut this off, you're gonna see the, those people there and they're black and white, which means it's shutting down. When they're in color, it's turning on. Um, you'll say, why in the heck does that matter? Because it takes a long time to turn on, and I'm, I get really annoyed with it, hit this button a bunch of times. And so <laughs> that's, if you see it coming in color, you can say, okay, I'll wait, it's coming on. In this case, you know, it sits like this, you're like, my goodness, come on. So it does some kind of shutdown thing where it, um, so it does that. Now, we put heaters on all these, and if anybody is on a vent really longer than ER, they really need to have a heater. It, uh, they need to have the air heat, heat and humidified. So a lot of times we kind of forget to hook these up, but it's always good something to remind their RT, hey, can we hook up the heater for this? Because if you're bypassing anybody's, anybody's upper airway, for one, or bypassing any part of their nose and whatnot, you have, so your body does something real specific by the time it gets to the, by the time the air gets to the crying. So by the time the air gets right to here, the body is gonna make it 37 degrees Celsius and 100% saturated with, with water. And it will do it at all costs. So what we do, if when we take a breath in spontaneously now, it goes through your, take it through your nose, you take it all the way down, it's heated, humidified, it's great by the time it hits the carina. Your body doesn't want to put dry or cold air down on your lower airways because that's where you can have some bronchial spasm. So if we stick an ET tube down to right here and we blow dry air in, it really is pretty harsh on them. A couple things we do to fix that. We put a little, little box up here. It's called an HME heat moisture exchanger. So what it does is when the air comes out, this little, um, it's like a little filter here. It holds the heat and the moisture and when the breath is given back through, that's given to the air. So it kind of holds the moisture in. But it's really important to have this heater hooked up, especially if they have mucus issues. <clears throat> because where is the body going to pull moisture from? Your mucus. Mucus. And it's the exact same reason why if you have somebody that has a stoma. So they have a stoma here. And they're breathing in and out of here. There's a much shorter place and they're bypassing their nose. So when they start to get sick and they start getting dehydrated, they're, they're gonna start pulling and they almost always have these type of secretions, but your body's constantly pulling this heat and humidity away, pull the humidity away and you get that really thick, tenacious mucus. That's why the trach patients have that. It's because it's not heat and humidified. So we try to do that in the hospital. We heat it or humidify it one or the other and then of course, if we put a, a ventilator on, we want that done too, because we don't want to cause mucus plugging and whatnot to go on down there. So one button to turn it on, and you're gonna see it does take a while, which just annoys me, but that's what it is. It does take way too long. Like I'm, I'm doing this right now, okay? Come on, my arms work out. <laughs> 
ramp it up here. Ramp it up. Yeah. I'm gonna switch my other hand. All right, so it's in color, and this is gonna come on. So.